Okay, great. Um, I just want to thank the organizers, and I want to thank you for holding this event. Uh, the way I see it, this is really moving beyond occupation to education, which is, I think, the right move to make. I think Harvard has many responsibilities, like all um, big institutions, but there's one responsibility it has that's unique, uh, and that is to learn and teach about important issues of today. So um, I think you are right to ask it and to ask us to do that. And um, in real curricular terms, that's a compelling demand that uh, you and we can make and one the university can and should be eager to meet. So let me give you an, uh, an example. I'm going to start, in fact, where Richard Parker left us in some ways, and that is with the financial crisis as a matter of education. So the financial crisis begs analysis. Uh, it was a mammoth bank run fueled by bad assets, the toxic assets he spoke about, um, and enabled by a structure of investment that depends on short-term borrowing. So the costs of that debacle are inestimable, but I'm going to throw out a few facts. Eight million people lost work as a result of the financial crisis in the U.S. alone, immediately, uh, directly as a result of the crisis. The economic recession that followed drove unemployment still higher. As we know, it's close to 9%. Holdings in one kind of paper, the kind of paper that acts as the short-term uh, investment paper, the deposits, if you remember Richard's um, analogy to banks, right? The deposits of the banking system, of the shadow banking system. One kind of paper, asset-backed commercial paper, the deposits on which the run occurred fell from almost 1.2 trillion in 2007 to 400 billion in 2011. So it gives you a sense of the contraction, right? The extent of the run that was the financial crisis. The Federal Reserve accepted as collateral between one and two trillion dollars of assets that investors were unwilling to fund during the crisis. And it guaranteed four trillion dollars of these deposits, right, the short-term IOUs, mostly money market mutual fund shares. Managing the rescue became the job of the Federal Reserve rather than focusing on unemployment or on distributive concerns. And as we know, um, the recession has defined politics with fairly disastrous results ever since. So the effort to understand this phenomenon, it seems to me, is huge. We need to understand its genesis, its dynamics, how it worked, its, inter its interconnections, its the alliances that, um, that produced the crisis uh, and the effects of the crisis. So in that sense, it seems to me that the project of education has become urgent. Uh, where do we stand on the project? I think that our understanding of the financial crisis is scandalously small. Um, so the conventional approach is that booms and busts are a fairly natural phenomenon. There are times we can hold them back. You know, maybe, as Richard said, right after the Depression, we regulated heavily, we held them back, but they're a natural occurrence. Um, they've happened for centuries and they'll continue to happen. They're inevitable. They're part of the law of the market, as it were. So that view turns out to be wrong according to the history, according to our history. Booms and busts like this one are specific to systems that create liquidity on leveraged assets in particular ways. They're a function of our monetary architecture. There's something we designed and we can change. So I want to suggest that approach today. I'm going to make three basic points. Uh, the first is that law and legal institutions make money. That's how we create a medium. The second is that money made by law has taken a wild variety of forms over different societies, including a wild variety of forms within the Anglo-American world. And third, those different forms of money facilitate exchange differently. That is, they create different market dynamics. The point is, we make the law that makes the money, that makes the market that we inhabit. So, uh, more briefly, we make the market. We can make it in different ways. Um, the ways that are more efficient, more just, more progressive than, uh, than the one we've got. So why do I say this? Uh, 
It turns out that we can break money down into the parts that make it. We can map its design, and we can see how its design affects the market. One way to do that is to look at our past, decoding what other monies we have used and what markets they have created. And when we do that, what we see is a large transformation in the way that we've made money. Uh, so we can unpack that transformation, and we can figure out how money's elements work and how they might be assembled in a better and fairer way. So I'm going to do a really short version of that um, tonight. So first, a preview, and then the slightly longer story, taking a look at each of the parts um, of the pre of the, that I'll mention in this kind of short overview. Uh, so the short story. Until the early modern period, European governments made money very differently from the way that we make money today. Governments charged their citizens for money, and you went to the mint, and you paid for the coin that you got. Governments could do that because as the entity common to all participants in a community, they monopolized the ability to make money. So making money, it turns out, is a task that requires relating people and their resources in ways that package value. So you have to actually work. It's a governance project right? to, to relate people and their resources in ways that create and maintain a unit of account that uh, establish a mode of payment, money is a unit of account, and a mode of payment, uh, and that also support it as a medium of exchange. So it's public or collective authority that has that capacity and can establish the terms on which money is made. As a result, if you think about the medieval period up to the early modern period, people bore the cost of making money, and liquidity was scarce. So there were no booms and busts of the kind we've just experienced. There were different crises, to be sure. Right? There, were, there were crises of scant liquidity. There were moments of debasement and problems with debasement. There were problems with counterfeiting. But these were crises that had very different causes and effects and distributive outcomes than the ones that we have. So uh, a change occurred at the end of the 17th century. The English government decided to license banks, one bank in particular, to issue money. So there's the Bank of England, one of the earliest notes of the Bank of England. The government paid the bank to lend to the government in the form of notes. And it allowed the bank to lend to others in the same notes. The government recognized those notes as money, which it had never done with any other non-sovereign form. Right? We'd only had coin monopolizing the identity of money before this time. This was possible because if you think about what was happening here, the government was just using its monopoly power in another way. Right? It's using its capacity in another way. Here, it's distributing the power to make money to the bank in exchange for a useful relationship with the bank, um, one that allowed the government to expand public debt in exchange for immediate notes. Right? That's the deal. That's the new deal that the government drives, the English government drives, with the Bank of England. But notice an important structural shift in what's happened, right, in the way that money's made. Finance becomes the way to make money. So um, literally, so I mean the way to produce currency. So long-term debt, we have long-term debt, the government's borrowing, funded by short-term money, the banknotes. Right? That's the basic structure. And that's been facilitated because the public, the government, goes from charging to paying for money and in particular, from, to, from monopolizing its power over currency to dispersing its power over currency, distributing it to the bank. So uh, what difference does it make? The government's created a new industry, which is the industry of making money, of producing liquidity. Right? It's that, that is the, the point of the banking industry. Um, and between the founding of the bank and the modern moment, the money supply in England increases enormously. I'm going to come back with some numbers in a minute. A new fragility also characterizes the monetary system, because the structure of the monetary system invites runs, right? runs on the bank. So we have short-term instruments, the money, funding long-term debt, the government borrowing in the, in the original case. And there will be times when people doubt the long-term debt. And when they doubt the long-term debt, um, they cash out the short-term instruments. And so we've structured booms and busts into the monetary form. 
Um, finally, just as the government ultimately controls liquidity creation, it's the actor that steps in with money. It still has the capacity to make money, the rescue. So that's why the government is the only uh, actor that can actually bail out um, uh, banks when the, when the crash happens. OK, so the longer story. So now I'm going to talk, I'm going to just tell the same story with more detail as much as I have in you know, half an hour. Um, so first, uh, making money. I, and I'm going to get substantive here because I think we're up against something really substantive. Uh, how is money made by law? How does the public, the government, make money? How does it have, why does it have the monopoly, if you will? According to the economist, money performs three functions. So money acts, this gets a little technical, but stay with me. Money acts as the unit of account, as the mode of payment and store of value, and as a medium of exchange. So the economists, for reasons you've probably gone through during the afternoon, stop, they stop there with just a functional analysis without asking anything more about money. They stop there, that's where we start, right? Um, because a society gains a unit of account, a mode of payment, a medium of exchange, by organizing itself to produce those functions. So we should ask, we can ask and we should ask, how does a society organize itself to produce those functions? Or more precisely, how do societies organize themselves to produce those functions? Because they can do it in many different ways. Money is a project, it's an institution. It's an ongoing uh, governance effort. It's not a simple or spontaneous convention. It's not a commodity. It's neither of those things. It's not a simple social custom. It's an orchestrated affair a really highly institutionalized affair. And it can be done in many different ways. And if you see how a community's money works, then you learn a lot about how its capital dynamics work, how its, how its market works. OK, so how does society organize itself to produce these functions that the economists identify? Money is a unit of account. Seems obvious, right? The one that's most often skipped, actually, when people are talking or even making any kind of effort. It's just a measure. OK. That's not so obvious. How do you measure value? How do you set a reference point that will operate to, um, to identify amounts of value? Here's how, uh, how we've done it in the past and still do it today. Societies make a measure by setting aside a certain amount of material value. They identify actually a certain amount of material value. It can be tangible or intangible. And second, they treat that certain amount of material value as especially fluid. So they add a kind of liquidity premium, right? There's my material value and my liquidity premium. For B, this material value is all the more valuable because it is liquid, right, is the way money works. Societies then ordain that specially liquid unit uh, of material value with a count, right? And the count is different from either the material value or the liquidity premium. It actually encompasses both. Right? So the account is meant to encompass both of those things and capture the material value and the liquidi liquidi liquidity add-on um, together. So an example, a coin is made of silver. Uh, it gains part of its value from its metal content and part of its value from the fact that it's packaged as coin and treated as money by the society that's using it. Um, so the count of the coin is different from the weight of silver, and it's different from the value of that weight of silver, right? It's a different entity, um, and it's more than either that amount of silver or the liquidity of coin taken alone, and it's that extra, it's the value of that count that people are willing to pay for. So the reason people went to the mint in the old days is that they wanted the extra value that came with coin. You could buy more with coin than you could with raw silver. So there are other ways to build uh, an object that has material value and liquidity, as we'll see in a minute, um, but that's the basic idea in every society that I've looked at. So uh, the next function, money as a mode of payment, or as it's sometimes called, um, a store of value. So a particular money becomes identifiable, becomes an identifiable mode of payment. There they are paying, um, insofar as public action makes it relevant to people. So um, the government does that by demanding, the government picks out and um, 
identifies a, the object as a mode of payment when it actually um, uses that mode of payment. So when it spends in a particular item and it demands that particular item. So this guy is not a random guy. He's the tax collector, right? If you think about it for a minute, uh, what better way to signal the dominant mode of payment in a society than if the biggest creditor in the society demands that in payment, that's the government as tax receiver, and if the bigger debtor, biggest debtor in a society uses that object, only that object, um, that's the government as spender, right? The government uh, paying soldiers, suppliers, contractors, others with the, the mode of payment. That item becomes the most liquid thing in a society. That's the one that's kind of at the top, as you know, uh, you sometimes hear the top of the hierarchy of liquidity. Today we have a whole hierarchy, and these days they actually didn't have too many choices. But if you have a hierarchy, this is the most liquid thing. Because you can pay your tax, it has immediate value in that sense. Note also that the government's action becomes a very important intervention in defining the flow of money, right? The income and the inflow and outflow of money. Um, the delivery of money into circulation and out of circulation matters because um, money gains a particular value insofar as it exists in a certain amount in society and insofar as people can predict that amount. This is something the economists have taught us, right? There's a, there's a money path and we're going to look, we're gonna, but we're going to notice the hydrants and drains, you know, how money comes in and out. Um, and that, knowing the predictability of that is what allows people to estimate present and future value and attribute that to the count. So money as a store of value is not, um, that's not a spontaneous occurrence. That's because the government is somehow regulating, is injecting and, um, uh, and, and withdrawing money from society. Uh, to pick up our coin, coin exaction uh, example, the government taxes in coin and spends in coin, and coin as a unit of account becomes something with value that people know, that they expect and predict, and therefore calculate on. Okay, we're almost there. Third function, money as, uh, as a medium of exchange. Just like money as a unit of account, and money as a mode of payment, or store of value, money as a medium of exchange doesn't just happen, it's actually structured by law and engineered by people using law into money. So uh, having created an object that is flowing from government to individuals, right? So remember we had a unit of account that's flowing between individuals and their government, which is both spending it and taxing it in, people can use that object along the way. Uh, at least they can use that object as long as the government takes money from you, you could use it as long as the money that's circulating between individuals and the government is taken by the government as still good despite the fact that it's changed hands in the meantime, right? Despite the fact that it's transferred in the meantime. Um, so if you think about a personal IOU, you give to your friend, your friend gives to the store owner, store owner can't get very far with that. If you give money to your friend and, the, and your friend gives that to the store owner, the store owner takes that to the government pays his taxes with it. That can travel, right? That's a different, a different animal. So an object becomes currency. It becomes easily transferable when a government accepts an object even though it's been transferred, right? Accepts it for, for its taxes. And when courts recognize the object as the object that pays off a debt. Um, so to finish with our coin example, coin was ex uh, accepted no matter how many hands it had passed through in the medieval period. Uh, indeed, nobody knew how many hands it had passed through unless it looked like this. We can come back to this. This caused some problems, right? This was one of the problems of their era. Um, and the English courts enforced coin in settlement of debts. Uh, and uh, that was the only medium accepted in many common law actions. And the fact that that medium was, con uh, was accepted in common law actions made it flow in private exchange like nothing else. There's no other object like it. In the, in the medieval period. OK, so once we know how money's made, now we're going to go, I'm just going to talk briefly about commodity money and the kind of market that it produced. Um, because we understand now that it's engineered, so having looked at its engineering, we can then step back and ask what kind of market uh, it produced. Uh, so commodity money, we've already done much of this story. So I'll just recap it and give you a sense of, um, of the kind of 
market it produced. So money as an engineered project. Commodity money was offered by count. Pennies, for example, these are Anglo-Saxon pennies that you're looking at. Um, people bought it when the price was right. They bought it at the mint. Um, and the count included both the material value and the, um, the gain that it had from looking the way it does and from being treated the way it was by the government. The sovereign taxed and spent in that, another tax collector, right? There's a reason these pictures were so common in the, in the old medieval painting. Um, taxing and spending drove up the demand for coin. It had at least the value necessary to pay taxes. It, oh, there was a floor to its value, actually. People also used it along the way. So here we have the medieval market as a medium of exchange. In, in, in fact, as I said, that was pretty much their only choice as a medium of exchange where strangers were concerned. Other currencies didn't have legal force, and therefore they couldn't use them. Um, they wouldn't be supported in court. So in ways we could, we could explore more, that creates a certain effect. So what kind of market was this in the picture? This was a market where coin was scant because people economized on buying coin. Nobody wanted to actually be the one who went in and paid for the coin. Uh, prices were low. Remember how you sort of think if you, in, your, in your history courses or something, you're aware of people making a penny a day? Prices were low because silver had a high value and many exchanges, and they didn't make low denominations, so many exchanges dropped below the denominational floor of money. That meant that there was lots and lots of informal credit, not between strangers, but between these people who knew each other at the market. Sounds very romantic. In fact, it, in fact the, the manor courts were full of litigation over people suing each other because somebody would, when, they, when, when times got particularly bad or the tax man came, they would sue their neighbor, right? So it was, a, it was a stratified society that was really bad for the people at the very bottom of the economic pile, not so bad for people who were working more above that denominational floor. I could go on, but you get the point. This was a very peculiar money, and it created a very peculiar market um, with its own problems, but booms and busts were not one of the problems, um, certainly not in England. There's some debasement problems that we, where we see prices rise, not at all like our booms and busts, um, and actually not at all in England. Uh, so, except Henry VIII, okay, I have to say that. Um, bank money in the market it made, where do booms and busts come from? So booms and busts come with a new money, and the radical change starts here. This is Charles II, who's just like, I love this picture because he doesn't look at all like a radical innovator. Um, <laughs> Uh, he doesn't, but he starts messing around because he's so, um, he's so stressed for funds, one of the last stewards, right? He's so stressed for funds that he starts messing around with the government's monopoly over money, and he starts paying for liquidity rather than charging for it. So, um, so let's see how this happens. First of all, he begins to pay for minting. So for the first time in centuries, the English pick up the cost of minting coin. And the reason he's doing that is because he wants to attract more silver to the mint. If people don't have to pay for coin, right, they'll bring their, their raw silver to the mint. He can make more money. That will increase the amount of liquidity in England. Right? So he's after that. Then he invents government bonds. So um, he's tired of, buy, of borrowing at high rates from the Italian you know, banking houses. Or more precisely, he can't borrow anymore. So his minister, George Downing, you've heard of Downing Street, right? George Downing points out that um, if the government borrows broadly from the public, it can, it, and very reliably, it can lower the rate. It can borrow at a lower rate, right? It can borrow for lower interest. So uh, Charles innovates the first English government bonds on which he'll pay in interest, right? He will pay for, um, for the bonds, and Parliament agrees to let the bonds circulate. So here's where we are. We're almost there. We're almost to money, but not quite. We've gotten this far, right? The government's paying to use someone else's money in the bonds, and it's also loosening up on its monopoly over currency, right? Because it's letting these bonds circulate. Okay, so now we fast forward to the, this is two monarchs later, right? We get rid of James, who's a steward who hardly lasts a few years. Then we get to William III. This is after the Glorious Revolution. Um, the English established the Bank of England. Now, the way this works, um, 
is that the government will borrow from the bank in the shape of the bank's promises to pay. Right? So it's as if the government is borrowing from the bank. by It's borrowing money in the form of the bank's bonds. Right? The promises to pay um, are little bonds that circulate that the public can cash. Okay? So at first, it's just another way to, to borrow. The bank is um, 1.5 million. They lend the government 1.5 million. It's a big establishment. This is where the bank is first situated. They lend to the government in the form of these paper notes. Um, the government pays out of general tax revenues for the, for the loan, right? Can, we keep, can I finish? Okay, I gotta be really, I gotta be really fast. Okay, it's such a good story though. Um, okay, people can cash the notes, but um, the government then, here's what happens next. The government monetizes these notes, and this is the big step. So um, ha you know what to look for. It begins to treat them as money. What makes them money? First of all, this is denominated in the unit of account, right? It's assimilated to the pound. The big, the, then the, the really radical move is that the government starts to take these notes in taxes. Right? It didn't used to do that. It used to let the bonds float on their own. It starts taking them in taxes, and then it lets the notes, or from the beginning, actually, it lets the, boat, the, um, the notes circulate. Right? Oh, this is the government taking it in taxes. Here are people beginning to use bank money, no longer medieval money, as, um, as the currency. Okay, so we'll just take a quick look at this new kind of money. So this is based on a whole new mechanism of production from the old money. All right? The bank notes depend on the government borrowing from the bank and the bank lending in the form of, of promises um, to pay or bank notes. Pretty soon the, the government extends that system to let individuals also give money to the bank and borrow from the bank. That's individual deposits and individual borrowing from the bank, all of which are um, cashed out, if you will, in the shape of bank notes, increasing the money supply. So, um, the government's engendered this new form of money, if you followed the story, which I won't recap. Between 1688 and 2010, 2010, here's the increase. If you look at what this means is basically in the amount of money, when you go to a system in which the government's paying for money and paying a new industry to produce liquidity, there is, what this means is from 12 million pounds in England to um, more than 1 million pounds, that's an increase of 100,000 by a factor of 100,000. That much, it, liquidity increases by a factor of 100,000. Um, that much more money. Um, distributive effects, enormous, and we don't know them all, right? Some of them are good. We've released the people on the bottom below the denominational uh, floor from the scarcity and disparity that they didn't have money. On the other hand, we've empowered an industry that actually will earn money on producing money, right? Um, and, uh, and there are other effects as well, like new legalities, new shapes of contracts to make the promise work. So if you're a law student, um, contract changes, um, new theories of self-interest. If you think about this moment for a minute, um, when the banks inaugurated, self-interest has a whole new role here, which is, appears to be beneficial and patriotic. You lend to the government and you profit yourself. Um, but look at the structure of, of liquidity. The structure of liquidity is much more unstable, right? Because you have short-term notes funding long-term borrowing. I'll just I'll stop by bringing it back to the financial crisis. Um, an increasing number of analysts are demonstrating that the financial crisis was, as I said at the outset, a massive bank run. And this comes back to Richard's point. Um, basically, the shadow investment banks are working on the same model, right? They're taking the principle that they've learned from banks. They are less highly regulated, much less highly regulated. Um, and the shadow banks borrow long term. Let's see where I left this. Okay, so now we're at the booms and busts. This is the instability. They borrow, sorry, they, they borrow um, th short term through all sorts of short term instruments, which are these little short term IOUs treasury repo and mutual funds, and they lend long-term. That was the bad assets, right, the mortgage-backed securities. So it's the same structure that's an unstable structure, and without things like deposit insurance, it's a much less stable structure than the banks, which we'd already learned were unstable. 
Um, so this near money uh, actually doubles if you look um, at the amounts of money out there in circulation. There are about seven trillion conventional dollar uh, units, and there are twice that many if you count the near money IOUs that the, that the investment banks use to fund themselves. Um, so that was the money on which there was a run in the last crisis. If you think about the rescue, the rescue was um, okay, brings this home back to the government because it's the Fed that stepped in, still with the capacity um, to make money. And the, the Fed's rescues, if you take them apart, were predominantly about unfreezing the short-term IOUs market. That is, they're guarding, they're re-infusing money into what were the deposits in the shadow banking sector. So all those guarantees that I talked about, the $4 trillion in guarantees, that was all to unfreeze the money markets and the repo markets. Um, why can the public always step in? The public can always step in because it has the capacity, ultimately retains the capacity to make money. So the taxpayer, ultimately, um, by taking public debt or taking collateral, that's the Fed, either taking public debt or taking collateral, can produce money, which you use as the unit of account and you pay taxes in, and you use as a medium of exchange. So ultimately, you are making the money that makes the market that made the financial crisis possible. So I will end there. My, my proposition is that we can remake the market. We've made it, we've remade it before. It should be reformed now. Okay, thanks. So, uh, I know you stopped because your time was up. Perhaps you could tell us in what ways we're going to reform or remake what the financial your, institutions. Yeah, so, um, so it's a great question. It's a really big question and um, here are a couple of possibilities, right? So one, so one possibility is, uh, on which there's a lot of good writing, we could create an insurance scheme for the shadow banking industry just like the insurance scheme we created for the banks. There's um, some good writing about that uh, by Morgan Ricks, who's at the law school. There's another um, set of um, suggestions made by a guy named Perry Merling about who's on the Institute for no, New Economic Thinking on their blog who talks about how we should actually revise what the Fed does and rethink what, how, when it intervenes in the market. I mean, in some ways, it's a more cautious, he's, he's moving more cautiously and just saying it should, it should um, figure out what's coming and take the right prudential action. It should act right like a Fed as opposed to wrong like a Fed. You, we can get more radical than either of those by rethinking whether this amount of liquidity makes sense. So I guess the, um, the Robin Hood tax is in a way slowing, you know, putting the brakes on the creation of liquidity by the shadow banks. Um, and without knowing enough, because I'm mostly a historian, I'm more attracted towards the ideas that try to rethink the design, like um, intervene in the amount of negotiability. And the, all of this, the whole shadow banking industry, all of their products, the products that they use to fund themselves, are only negotiable because courts enforce them, right? because we've allowed them to be negotiable. So I don't quite agree that this is out of our control. It's got to be international, all those things. I think, actually, we could just rethink, you know, in the law school, we see contract change all the time. There's no reason why all these things have to be negotiable. There'd be all these arguments about what was good to negotiate and what wasn't. Um, by negotiable, I mean you know easily transferable, as opposed to compromise. Um, so, uh, so I think there are all sorts of possibilities. The way that they created this system, when I went back and kind of went through it, it's just improvising. They don't actually see what they're doing, and it's only in retrospect that it all coheres and hangs together, and you kind of get the result. Um, which, doesn't, and which may be the way that we change it, but we could also try to be a little more cognizant of what was happening. I mean, I think we can figure out a lot um, at this point and, and really then redesign it. It's a great question. It's the real question.
should the Fed itself be regulated? Would, would that change the situation you've described? So, um, so I don't know. How, how, I don't know how we rethink the Fed, but it's what I want to find out. So, and, the, and the reason this is an interesting, it, it, uh, I'm totally willing to admit that, is that if you think about the law school, if you look at the law school and you look at what we teach when we t teach the Constitution, we teach you know, the First Amendment, we teach separation of powers, we teach equal protection, all good things, right? I'm in favor of teaching them all. Do we actually teach nothing about the structure of the way money's made and power's regulated. So I'm only starting to learn, about, I mean, I've been working on this for 10 years and I still feel like I've only gotten to the modern era and we don't, and there's not curricular space right now um, to, to actually, I mean, I, I will invent a course, I'm in the middle of inventing a course that's about money and the Constitution and it's trying to figure out what your question would require is for me to understand more about how the Fed relates to the Treasury and you know, when the Treasury borrows money, does the Fed get, you know, does the Fed just get to decide when to actually do open market operations? What, you know, what should be its mandate? All of that is just notorious, is, uh, I would say, scandalously understudied. There's no curriculum there, right. even though I think it's the biggest constitutional issue of our times. Thank you.